Uh, good morning. Today we are talking about shaping story and owning narrative, particularly in new ways with new platforms. I have three game changers with me this morning. Uh, starting from the far end and working in, we have Shezza Shannon, who is from 1001 Innovations, a science and cultural heritage organization sharing achievements from the Muslim world. Jauhara al sakal from Jaff Inc., a creative community based here in the UAE for readers, writers, and artists. And Rahman Nawaz from When Women Win, which is a top-ranking iTunes podcast. And we're going to tell our stories today. We're going to talk about how they're created in a traditional format. I'm a former newspaper journalist, so I thought that we would follow the old who, what, where, why, and when to explore the best way to get your message across. Let's start with the what, ladies. Let's talk about what you are all doing. We'll start and move outwards. Rana, do you want to tell us about what you're doing sure. with When Women Win? Sure. When Women Win is a podcast. Uh, does anyone here listen to podcasts? Addictively. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So, as you know, a podcast is an online, on demand radio show. And I created When Women Win a year and a half ago to plug a gap that I saw, which was women in middle management did not have access to senior female role models. So, that's the problem I'm trying to solve. And I interview on When Women Win, it's an interview style podcast. And I alternate. So one, one episode will be an Arab role model, and uh, the next one will be an international role model. Because while I want to improve access to role models for women in middle management, I also want to break the stereotype of what a boss lady looks like and sounds like. So I want to push Arab role models globally and bring international role models into the region. Because it's listened to in 144 countries, so it's a big opportunity. Do you know anything that you can share with us about your listenership, the numbers? I don't, well, 144 countries, the biggest market is Saudi Arabia, uh, which I was really pleased at because it is in English, it's an English language mm -hmm. show, and uh, it is radio, you know, they tell you, oh, the Saudis, they only watch video content in Arabic. Well, it's not true, it's just not true. Jauhara, yes. tell us what you're doing um, at, with your creative crates, and you've got one with us as well. Yes, I do. Well, um, we started Jaffink, my partners and I, uh, as a, a media platform for artists and, uh, and people who are creatives, um, because I feel like just artists is limiting, so authors, poets. Um, we started it, and we wanted to reach out to people uh, in the Emirates, to readers, and we came up with the Ink Crate. It is a monthly book subscription box, uh, here, this is your box, Brandy. Um, it's a monthly book subscription box that we curate around the theme. And we have a mystery book each month. Um, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun receiving a box because Do we Do you want to show us what's in it? Yes. <laughs> Open the box. Mm. Oops. So when we first got together, we wanted to encourage people to read and try to create things. So each box, you'd receive a task or uh, an, uh, a form of art or a message. And uh, this month, this box is actually Custodians of the Earth. So you've got in there a relevant book? Yeah, a relevant book, three to five items. Usually it's you know, either uh, something to create or to paint or draw or sketch. Even one month we did magnetic poetry, which was very... Cool. <laughs> Here you go, Brandy. This is my box. <laughs> <laughs> what's in what's the box? I'm going to show you what's box. in the box. Apart from a Neil Gaiman quote on the front, make good art and love Neil yeah, Gaiman. We're, we're big fans. Big fans of Neil Gaiman. The um, there's a letter explaining the philosophy of the box and what's inside it and why, quite detailed, two sides. Um, in this pouch, I know we have, because uh, we all know plastic straws are yeah. 
also we have reusable straws. I feel like I should be on QVC, the shopping <laughs> channel. Reusable straws. Tell me, yeah. are you sourcing all of this stuff, especially are you bringing it into the country? What are you, yeah, how are you we, finding? We, we try to reach out to local artists to include the, uh, the items, and uh, we even did a competition once and featured the sketch of the winner on the notebooks that we've given out. And these pencils, once you have finished writing with them, there's a seed yeah. at the very end, and you plant them and grow your pencil. Wow, <laughs> that's cool. Um, and there's more in here too, books, globe stress balls, fabulous. And uh, the solar panel, um, recharging the... the yes, yeah. recharge your phone with solar. We, we, really we went all out with, with the custodians of the earth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I happen to know if you go on the website, you can not only order this month's box, but you can order previous yeah, you can, boxes you can as order well. previous boxes and also to gift them to people. Hello. So if you had a theme in mind to gift to someone, you just let us know and we'll work around the theme and create a custom box. Wow. Fantastic. I was going to ask how much it costs. Yeah, um, well, we have different pricings because there's the one-time purchase, there's a three-month uh, subscription, and uh, there is a recurring monthly subscription. So fantastic box for, yeah. for so book So this lovers. is just one of the ways that we try to, to reach out to, to people who love to read, to, to create things, um, and of course to write. Um, we try to include their things, we try to build that community that we aim to do when we first started Jaffing. And Shetha, with 1001 Inventions, tell us first off what you're doing. Basically, we tell stories. We package stories from the history of this region. Um, and we make them into uh, exciting stories to excite people, young and old. We generally target all our stories to a family audience, but we have the kids in mind all the time. So we make books, we make films, we make exhibitions, um, you know, educational materials, and we go global. It's not only for the Middle East, it's global. What we've noticed over the years uh, that we've worked here, that there are kind of two kind of things. One in the West, there's a gap of knowledge about the history of this region and the history of what we term as Muslim civilization. So if you open, I mean, I don't know whether this is still the case now, but at least 10, 15 years ago, if you open a history book or a science book even, say in, in the UK, then you'd find that the book would immediately jump from the, the Greeks and the Romans and then straight to the 17th century. And there's a gap of almost 1,000 years where it's as if nothing has happened in humanity. And that can't be true, right? Yeah. Uh, so we try to kind of fill that gap. Uh, when we came to the Arab world, I mean, I was educated in Syria. And, uh, and there, you know, our school books, whether it's history or science or whatever, would mention some guys. So, you know, you'd see a, um, a photo of an old guy with a l very long beard and whatever, and, and they tell you this is called Ibn al-Haytham. Okay, great. He was born in year blah, 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 died in year blah, blah, blah. I can't even remember. And then this guy was great at um, optics. Okay, great. Ibn Sina, blah, 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 you know, all these names. But as a kid, you don't really connect with these guys. So uh, what, we, what we've done is like, you know, for example, this is Ibn al-Haytham as we show it, right? For me, I would have never have dreamed that in my book I would see Ibn al-Haytham like this. So we make it alive. We bring these characters, we make them alive, we tell their stories. Quite a lot of them have some really, really interesting stories. So this guy, for example, had to travel from his homeland in modern-day Iraq all the way to Egypt in order to, you know, to do something that he thought he was, gonna, he was very, very good at, and then he ended up in prison or under house arrest. And then after that, he managed to pick himself up and made discoveries that in our life today still influence our life today. So these guys, you know, this is what we do. We bring them to life. It's not only through books, but also, you know, as I said, through film, multimedia, different kind of format. Let's, you've all told us why you're doing what you're doing, but let's look at the actual deeper why. So, Shetha, why is it so important that children know about their scientific heritage, the, the heritage of discovery? Uh, for people from this heritage, you know, it's, um, I think the way to think about it is if you go for a job, what do you take with you? 
what do you take when you go for a job interview? You take a CV, right? Mm -hmm. What does your CV say? What you did. Yeah, it says everything about you. And what does that do to you? When you've got all that background of things that you've done, what does it do to you? It gives you that extra push at the interview. Mm -hmm. It's to empower you, absolutely. So this is exactly what we're doing. We're giving you, we're reminding people of their own heritage, what the contribution of that heritage has been to humanity at large, because that will give you not only pride in your own heritage and own culture, but also it will give you that push and empowerment to feel that, you know, I have a standing in this world. Not everything is imported from the West, right? Not everything is, is coming from China. So that's really important on the one hand. And for people from other cultures, it's really important as well because it connects people with one another. I remember a few years back when we had our first big exhibition here in Abu Dhabi uh, in 2008. Um, one lady who brought her kids, uh, she's, I think she was British, and she brought her students as well. And she said, this exhibition is amazing. Because you know what my kids told me? We respect the culture that we're in now because we appreciate what they have contributed to humanity. So it's really important to kind of instill those messages. In Rana, you talked about the fact that you saw a gap, that there wasn't um, a lot of narrative being put out there in podcasts from female managers. Why is it important that there is? We know that women are lagging behind in the business world despite lots of talk over the last 20 years about empowering women. And when we know now from decades of research what all professionals need to thrive. Uh, professionals need professional networks, professionals need role models, and several other things. And this role model aspect is missing for women in the world of business. And it could be because there are very few women at the top anyway, and then those women are traveling a lot. So for example, in this region, when I was 17 years in the corporate world, and when I got to the top, I was traveling all the time. I had a regional role. And so why I think it's really important is because when women look up and they don't see somebody who looks like them or talks like them, they think that that's not for them. So you can't be what you can't see, and that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So my why uh, is I think role models are really important to let women all throughout the organization understand that they have access to that position. And Jalhara, you're encouraging creativity with your boxes. I mean, that Neil Gaiman quote again, just yeah. make good art. Why is that important? Um, growing up, we, um, my partners and I, we were very artistic. Like, we would draw, sketch, paint, and take pictures. And, and even as children, like, that really influenced us and uh, our identity today. Um, Growing up and having that shape you, that's what we're trying to, to spread to the world. To tell them that, you know, you're never too old to try something new. You're never too old to try calligraphy for the first time, um, sketching, watercoloring. Even some people might say, oh, this is tedious or we don't have the time. But the effect on it, after a long day at work, just sitting and sketching, I feel like, I feel lighter. So what, why we do this is we want to spread the love of reading, of creativity. Everyone is creative in their own way. It doesn't mean that I have to paint like Goya, for example. That's, that's not a measure. Each person has their own touch. Mm -hmm. And I, we just try to, to guide them to find their skills or, or hone their skills. Um, even the reading, reading helps writing, helps describing words and, and putting, putting a nice story together, shaping a narrative. So we're, we're just giving tools to people to try different things. Let's talk about the where then, because we've done the what and the who. You've all using very different platforms, but you're also overlapping a lot. Talk to me about why you've chosen the, the platforms, the way of, of doing this, video, exhibitions, uh, physical objects, podcasts, and you're all on Instagram, social media, and the rest of it. Why you've chosen the platforms you have? Who wants to start? I can go. 
Well, for podcasts, the barriers to entry are very low. I have no background in media. I have no background in journalism. I'm, I'm a corporate person. I, did, I studied engineering. I did aircraft leasing for many, many years. So I really knew very little about broadcasting. And um, podcasts were very accessible to me. So that's one reason was my, the sort of supply side. And then if you look at the demand side, my goal was to make these role models who I interview accessible to everyone all over the world. This was never a regional game. This was never a Dubai game. When I started it, I was looking globally because this is a global problem, um, this gap in role models at the top. And so it was, it, I wanted to create a platform that was highly accessible by women all over the world. And uh, yeah, that's why. Jauhara, you're actually using your platform to promote other people, aren't you? Yes. To promote local artists. Yes. Tell me about that. Um, we try, well, the, when we started Jaffing, the aim was to create um, a community and to reach out to creators and, and, and people in the Emirates, uh, artists in the Emirates. So we try to get their information and try to stay in touch with them and encourage them to keep doing what they do and include their uh, their art in our box if it's a competition that we've made like I mentioned before we last time we uh, we did a competition for Alice in Wonderland and we had one of the one of the girls that sketched put the cup we put it on the notebook that went into our box we try our best to encourage people and stay in touch with them because it's it's a, about the sense of community. Mm -hmm. When you're an artist, um, you try to build a bond with a group of friends. For example, our group of friends is uh, Untitled Chapters. Um, they're speaking, I think, later tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so we try to to build that, you know, the support for for everyone because it's the, about the sense of community. The that is why we try to do what we do. Um, and we know that it's difficult for people to come and meet up at a certain place or a certain time with book clubs, especially because we, we did run a book club in the past. But it was not your traditional book club. It was bring your own book, mm. book club. Mm -hmm. So you'd bring a few books that you liked and read, and you'd bring a few. And we'd sit together, and we'd take pictures of, of the book. You'd tell me, like Rana would tell me about you know, a, a book that really affected her or touched her heart, and I would exchange it. So it's not, I think that people try not to, to, um, to stick to a traditional, you know, template of, okay, this is a community, you have to appear at these exhibitions or at a certain mm -hmm. time. A book club, you can't go to book club if you didn't read the book, you know, that, that sense. So we try to make it easy for people to reach out and, and to, to join um, a new circle of friends and learn something new while doing it. Well, while we're talking about platforms, Shedda, you're using pretty much every platform that you possibly could for your project. Because we're about connecting with people and winning hearts and minds. So, and we target family audience. You know, there may be special um, campaigns, we call them, like Each Story is a campaign that will target specifically a certain age group. But at large, you know, we're connecting with all people and with people from different cultures as well. And we're telling a story about culture and heritage. So, uh, so that's why we're, you know, we're everywhere. We do it in film because, you know, some people... Uh, you do it with books because some people really like to kind of read books. You do it with uh, music, for example, you know, with the Ibn al-Haytham campaign, for example, we had uh, Sami Youssef do all the kind of music track for the film. And the music track is separate, so people connect with that. So it's because we want to communicate these stories, and they're really lovely stories, so we're on every platform, exhibitions, exhibits, you know. Although we're not doing very good still on uh, the new media, like games and things like that, but we're, we're planning to kind of, of, of get there as well. But you're also using celebrities as your platform. Of course, because we're such a difficult, you know, particularly in the West, not everybody is going to want to, you know, the, 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 the minute they see Muslim in the title, they're going to tell you, oh, oh, 
sorry, we don't want anything to do with this. Yeah? So many times we had to reterm things and repackage it so that it's like it reads Arabic science rather than kind of Muslim civilization because it is more appealing for quite a lot of people, particularly in France, for example, and elsewhere. Um, um, so that's why, you know, when you use someone, one of our films, for example, for this uh, main book or the main campaign about the golden age of Arabic science or Muslim uh, uh, science from Muslim civilization was Ben Kingsley. And when you've got an Oscar winner like Ben Kingsley fronting a film, then can you think of a teacher at school who makes the decision about what to bring to a school? Wouldn't want to see a film that is starring Ben Kingsley and it's an educational film. Or the film with uh, Ibn al-Haytham, it was starring Omar al-Sharif. He was, you know, it was the last work of Omar al-Sharif, the last film before he passed away. And again, the decision maker that is making those decisions, whether it's the parent or it's the teacher at school, would have a connection with that celebrity. And then they'd want to see, oh, what did this guy do? You know, why is he in a film about Ibn al-Haytham? You know, so it helps really, it just helps to get your message to a wider audience. I think also that children would you know, go on YouTube and, and, and they have access to, to films and, and, and going and watching those movies, they would, uh, it's accessible to them as well. So they're also the decision makers. 100%, yeah. yes. Yes. If we look at the who, I feel like who tells stories and who owns the story is, is very important. So Shirza, why is it important for the Muslim world to, to talk about its own successes in this way? I think it's global heritage. It's, you know, no story is owned by a particular culture, is the way I see it. And cultures always feed into one another, and civilizations feed into one another. So it's a global story. It's our shared heritage as humanity. So it's really important that everybody knows about this shared heritage. Uh, and in a way, we've got a bit of a challenge here because, you know, if you look at something like this, you've got, and it's called 1001, it's 1001, it's a connotation in Arabic, alf uh, sorry, alf wa alf means that it's many, many, many. It doesn't literally mean 1001. Uh, so you've got thousands of years, you know, a thousand year amount of stories to tell, right? Mm -hmm. But the challenge is, is all these guys are dead that we talk about. We cannot, you know, they cannot talk about themselves. It's only their legacy that talks about them. So we've got a huge responsibility here in order to portray their stories to humanity in a positive way that would reflect their huge contribution to humanity. So you've almost got two audiences with this. You're building pride, um, particularly amongst the children whose heritage this is, but also educating people outside there. Yes. How do you get a message that speaks to both? It's really the same. Because you're communicating what these guys have done. You're communicating values. So when we've taken, for example, Ibn al-Haytham, right? You could say, oh, it's all about science and it's all about the uh, science of optics and what have you. But it isn't because this guy has a really interesting human story. He traveled from one place to another. He faced challenges. He was imprisoned. And then he rose about those challenges and managed to make something that helped humanity around him. This is a common value. It's nothing, you know, only about uh, a Muslim heritage or an Arab heritage or a European heritage. It's a common value. And therefore, when you're communicating values that are shared by humanity at large, then your job is easier in a way because everybody's picking up on those values as number one. Uh, rather than specifically thinking, oh, this is from the Muslim heritage, this is from the culture, the Chinese heritage. But what it's also in, you know, like making sure is that, that all these cultures do share the same values anyway. We are the same at the end of the day. Rana, talk to me about the importance of women owning their own storage, story and, and sort of shaping their own narrative, deciding what goes in and what doesn't. Yeah, I, I'm thinking now as I'm listening to Shaza how much more I know about other cultures than I do about our own, actually. Wow. And really, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, I could tell you more about the Incas, probably, than I could tell you about Ibn Haysam, which is terrifying. So I think it's really important that, that Arabs start to own the narrative, which, is, which you know, the media, global media, has sort of, uh, I don't know, hijacked. Uh, I think your work is really, really important. 
yeah. uh, on the story of, of women and why we should own our own narrative. You know, things have happened in my life where people tell me, shh, you know, don't tell, don't share, for whatever reason. Like, it could, uh, it makes me vulnerable or it might upset the person I'm talking to or anything like that. But for me, um, silence or secrecy always came with shame. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, for my own narrative, determined not to feel shame, not to feel guilt, you know, pushing back on my mom, <laughs> society at large. And, um, and so I think it's really liberating when we tell our own story. Because again, I, for me, secrecy is shame, and I don't want to feel shame. And I have nothing to be ashamed of, if, whether I'm talking about my, my battle with cancer, or I'm talking about things that happen or, with work. And the women that I bring on the show, um, I really try to draw out those nuggets too, you know? Make, and they feel, and sometimes it takes a little bit of coaxing, mm -hmm. um, but they also, when they come on, the idea is, look, the reason we're, you're on this show, the reason we're doing this show is to empower, empower others with knowledge, insight, inspiration, and tools. And they understand that uh, this is sort of a give and, and they're happy to share and do that. And, they, and that's the objective of sharing one narrative. We're not sharing a narrative just to say, oh, I got it out, you know. The objective is to empower others with insights and tools. I'm thinking about two specific things that you have written about, blogged about, spoken about, um, and I've read and heard you on it several times. One is your experiences of the, the corporate world, um, and the other is, as you say, your battle with, with cancer. Did you have to think about, do I really want to say this, you know, choose what to keep in, what to keep to yourself, what to let out? What was the thought process? Yeah, for the... For yes, both. For both. Um, for, the, for the corporate world, it was really important to me, given that my audience is women in business. Uh, not my, my only audience, but the, when, that's what my background, that's who I'm thinking of all the time. And so that, that's something that I'm very passionate about, is they need to hear these stories. They don't get enough of these stories. And every woman I talk to, because I led the GE Women's Network for the region, and I lead a business women's network across Dubai, and women feel that they're going through this alone. Mm -hmm. And so what my, one of my goals is, is to make them see that actually this, what you're going through, other women are going through, and build a community, as these ladies are saying, it really is about that to support each other. And a lot of people say, well, you know, what's the point of women talking to women? You know, that's not going to advance them professionally if all the, le the leaders are male. But actually, um, it serves a very different purpose. Connecting women to each other builds resilience. And resilience has been identified as something that gets more women to the top. So that's on the corporate side. On the, on the cancer side, actually, it was a friend of mine who runs an online um, publication, The Tempest. Uh, the Tempest is, um, I, I don't know how to describe it, it's an online platform, content sharing. And, uh, it's really awesome, they're doing great. As a result, I've invested in them, actually. Uh, so full disclosure. But, um, so she asked me as I was going through my chemo, I was about uh, halfway through and she said, could you please write an article about your experience? And of course, I was really reluctant. And I was reluctant because, not because of the shame thing, because I didn't want to uh, play that card, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't want her to think, I, I didn't want anyone to think, oh, she's writing about this for attention. Because I was already a little bit in the public eye with my speeches and my, uh, that had nothing to do with my disease and, my, and you know, when women win. And so I didn't want to bring up my disease as something that people would then say, ah, oh, look at her doing this for attention. And you know, people are, are, can be nasty. And, and so I was really reluctant for this one reason. It wasn't about sharing or anything. Um, but she, you know, she convinced me, by the way, she's 10 years younger than me. Actually, she's 16 years younger than me. She just turned 24. Oh, my God. And so she, she, I don't know if it's her Gen Z thing, but she was like, who cares about those people? You know, you're not going to reach them anyway, and they're, you're, not, you're never going to meet them, and they don't matter. And so just in her, you know, 23-year-old, you know, um, perspective, she really moved me. And so I thought, if I can, if I share this, and somebody reading it is going through what I'm going through and get something out of it, then it's worth it. And so that's why I did it. Johara, you've got obviously an online platform um, with your creative community. You share a lot about what you're, you're reading, what you guys are doing, also on Instagram, Facebook, you've yeah. got social media. How much do we 
share? Where are the lines for you? The sharing? Yeah. How much do you put out there? I, um, I think that we, you can tell the moods that we're in by what we post. <laughs> so I, I truly believe that if anyone is really, truly watching, they would know what, what is happening. Because sometimes we do the, um, uh, the word prompts um, or poetry prompts. So it's, it's a word, and you either write um, um, a poem or prose around it, or even a small, short story. Uh, you can tell so much by the few lines that we post online. We did uh, a writing workshop with the untitled chapters, and they had, they had given out small prompts on, on small paper. And they're like, OK, we're going to write for five, five minutes. Go. And we're sitting in a cafe, and we started writing. And I noticed that I was writing about something that I had kept you know, deep, deep, deep inside in the back of my mind. I didn't want to think about it. And it came up. So I think that through creativity, as soon as you just start doing something, it, it comes out. And we share those. So I'm not sure if, if anyone is you know, either appreciating the art that's coming out or is like, hmm, we know what they're <laughs> feeling right now. We've got about six minutes left. And my final who, what, where, when, why is what. And it's what next mm -hmm. from all three of you with what you're doing. Where are you taking it next? Who wants to start? I'll start. Uh, as I said, we've got a thousand years of stories to tell. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we have a lot of responsibility <laughs> on our hands. Um, and to, to tell more exciting stories and bring them to life. Those role models, if you like. You know, you're working with role models of the present day. We're working with role models of the past. Yeah. And uh, so far, we've focused more on stories of men. But we've got loads of women to talk about. So I think next, we're going to be uh, shining a light on some women. Yes. Good. Fantastic. Johara? Um, we, uh, with our Increate, um, in the works, we have the Increate Junior Inshallah. So for kids? Soon. For kids, yeah. For, for those below the age of 17. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we might collaborate also with <laughs> 1001 sure. Inventions. But um, I guess what's next for us is, yeah, it's for the children. Because when we came up with the concept of the Increate is to make it to facilitate. And we'd like to spread that to the children, uh, to the young readers. Um, uh, to, to bring them in on the boat to creativity and, and inspiration. Good. And Rana? My goal is to grow When Women Win 100x, so grow the impact of When Women Win globally 100x. And we're starting now. The big uh, news is that as of May 19th, Emirates Airlines will be airing When Women Win on all of their flights Amazing. through their ICE uh, platform. So, uh, yay. Yeah, <laughs> well done. You. So if anyone has any ideas on how we can get One Women Win to all English-speaking women everywhere, please let me know. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Rana Nuas, Jauhara al Sakal, and Shreza Shannon, thank you very much for joining me on the stage today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.